This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. This week, probably the worst stripe of villain that's been seen in New Zealand history, an Auckland property speculator. The solution to land banking is the national policy statement on urban development that requires... More and more land, it seems, is just being held for land banking. People are just riding the speculative wave, and the government is doing nothing. They they will be private uh, properties that people own, and they've made their own call... Uh, well, they made so we own. know that there are houses left empty as they wait to make a killing on them. Why should we allow that? Right now, these baby boomer bastards are driving house prices through the roof and making life generally miserable for everyone else in the country. But in the past, they were responsible for helping start and push along what's probably the most unjust war we've ever seen in this country, the Waikato War. The invasion of the Waikato by British and Allied troops in the 1860s was a complete disaster, especially for the Māori who lived there, but also for pretty much everyone else involved. There are very few winners. The whole invasion is supposed to make this uh, spectacular profit for the Crown, but it doesn't. It it turns into a uh, £3 million loss, which plunges the colony into recession. The British troops were sent out here to fight in the war, become increasingly disillusioned about about what they've been asked to do as well, um, especially as they suffer heavy losses of their own. And then there are the, the 4,000 or so men and their families who are recruited as military settlers and planted on the confiscated lands. And for many of them, the war is a disaster as well. That's Vincent O'Malley. He's a historian who's just recently published an exhaustive history of the Waikato War. It's called The Great War for New Zealand. And for a very small number of people, that war really was great. Chief among them was Thomas Russell, a man who made his fortune out of the Waikato War. Thomas Russell's family immigrated to New Zealand from Ireland when he was 10 years old. They arrived in Auckland just a few months after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840. But when he's just 17 years old, tragedy strikes Thomas's family. His mother dies in 1847, um, and his father goes off to the California gold fields and abandons the family. So Russell's still a, a young man himself, has got to look after and raise his family. Thomas rises to the occasion. Whatever else you might say about him, he was incredibly talented, driven and ambitious. When he graduated law school, he immediately demanded full partnership at the firm where he'd been working. When they turned him down, he set up his own practice. And he didn't stop there. When he was still in his 30s, he founded New Zealand's first insurance company. And when a bank turned him down for a loan in 1861, he decided to set up his own bank. You might have heard of it, because it's still around today. We're treating your money like it's never been treated before. So you, and your money, will both be better off at Bank of New Zealand. This is the main bank in the country that that Russell sets up. There's been much speculation as to whether he set that up for personal gain so that he could use it as as a source of funds. And much later on in life, when he runs into financial problems, there are are all sorts of... um, Manoeuvres that he that he undertakes with the bank that are, that become subject of, of allegations that he is he is using the BNZ for for personal gain. While Thomas is doing all this, cracks are starting to appear in the relationships between European settlers and Maori. In the 1840s, war had broken out between British forces and the tribes north of Auckland. Eyes had turned nervously to the south, with the settlers wondering whether the enormously powerful Waikato tribes would join the fight. That was certainly um, a nightmare scenario for many Europeans that that Auckland, if it was attacked from the north and south, uh, would have been virtually defenceless. At any point, really, prior to the 1860s, had Taino had the slightest inclination to do so, they could have obliterated the settlement of Auckland. They do the very reverse, that they vow to defend it. They moved there en masse to defend the Europeans of Auckland. And to Whiru Whiru, when he's asked to assist with the attack on Auckland, outright refuses and refers to Auckland as the hem of his cloak, which makes Auckland tapu because it comes into contact with him. And so what he's saying is that anybody who attacks Auckland attacks Te Whero Whero, the great great Waikato Tainui chief. So, you know, that's the ultimate defence really for that settlement. And Māori and the Waikato didn't just support Auckland militarily. One Auckland newspaper in the 1840s commented that the settlers of Auckland would have starved were it not for produce that Māori provided them. So... 
it's a very productive trade. And so they have this kind of symbiotic relationship with the settlement of Auckland. Supplying the hungry colonists of Auckland created an economic boom in the Waikato. Here's how the wife of New Zealand's first Chief Justice described the region as it was when she visited in 1852. For miles we saw one great wheat field. The blade was just showing of a vivid green and all along the way on either side were wild peach trees in full blossom. Carts were driven to and from the mill by their native owners. The women sat under the trees sewing flower bags. Fat, healthy children and babies swarmed around. During the height of its agricultural boom, wheat grown by Māori in the Waikato was being shipped as far away as San Francisco. Meanwhile, people like Thomas Russell are watching all this wealth and wondering if there isn't a way for them to get a slice. You know, in 1840, um, a few London ma- makers coloured New Zealand British red, but it didn't change the reality on the ground, and Māori continued to govern their own affairs as they always had. That's something that the European settlers resent, especially in a district like Waikato, uh, which contains some of the most valuable lands in the country. So 30 or 40 miles from downtown Auckland, you've got these incredibly value- valuable lands that many settlers are coveting but can't get access to. In the 1850s, a tipping point's reached. Demographics are starting to shift. By 1858, the European population outnumbers Māori for the first time across the country. And so you start to see this kind of period when Europeans feel confident enough to be able to assert their presumed racial dominance over Māori. And so that's another factor in the wars as well, these, these Victorian assumptions of racial supremacy and so on. What starts the war is complicated. It involves Waikato tribes' support for Taranaki iwi over a land dispute, false accusations that Tainui were planning to attack Auckland, claims the Kingitanga movement constituted a rebellion against the Crown, and also some good old-fashioned racism, as Vincent was suggesting. But there are also some very powerful people pushing for war, chiefly Thomas Russell and a man called Frederick Whitaker, another Auckland lawyer and speculator who was a leading figure in the colonial government. He serves as an attorney general many times. He goes on to become the, the country's premier uh, twice, I think, in the 1860s and again in the 1880s. And the two, I mean, they, they sort of seem to be a, almost a perfect partnership in some ways. I mean, they really complement each other. I think so, because Russell has the, the commercial nous and Whitaker um, more, the, more the political nous and... Um, I mean, Russell himself embarks on a political career, but it's quite a short-lived one. So uh, Whitaker is sort of um, his his uh, mouthpiece or his advocate within the political system, and it's, it's often sort of alleged that Russell is really the one pulling the strings behind the scenes. Jointly, Thomas and Whitaker form a pro-war faction, which pushes the governor, George Grey, to request huge numbers of British troops sail for New Zealand. At the height of the war, there were more British troops stationed in New Zealand than in Britain, 12,000 of them. For Grey, the objective was to put Māori in their place, to assert British power over them. Thomas and Whitaker had very different objectives. They're more interested in, in obtaining access to the lands in the Waikato. And you see these competing objectives actually through the course of the war because at various points there are opportunities to bring that war to an earlier end. But ministers are very, very keen to go even further south, so they're advocating an extension of military activity. General Cameron, who's in charge of the troops, become, himself becomes increasingly disillusioned with the war and he, he kind of sees it as a, a naked land grab that, that's been... Uh, pursued for the for the benefit of the likes of Whitaker and Russell, and he actually refuses after Rako to go any further south. Gray himself also falls out with with ministers. Um, by about May 1864, he starts to receive back reports from London that what's happening in New Zealand is subject to intense criticism, both from the colonial office, but also with the British public. And there's this long period where Gray argues with Whitaker and his other ministers over the amount of land to be confiscated, with ministers arguing for a larger amount and Gray for a smaller amount of territory to be taken. Eventually, Whitaker, who's now Premier, the equivalent of the Prime Minister, gets his entire cabinet to resign in protest. And when a new cabinet's sworn in, Gray backs down and accepts a larger amount of land should be confiscated. And while all this is happening, horrific atrocities are being committed against Māori. One of the worst worst episodes is um, 
the raid on Rangiafia, which is a, a settlement that's considered a place of refuge for women and tr- women children and the elderly, and that's raided early on a Sunday morning, February 1864, and you have sort of cavalry charging into the, the village and, and women and children and old men running everywhere. You also have a situation in which um, a whare or hut is deliberately torched by British troops. One old man attempts to come out and surrender, but is, but is shot dead and the others remain inside the whare as a result, and they're burnt to death. A few months later, another atrocity happens in Odako, when more than 300 people, including women and children, are trapped in a besieged pa. And after three days, without food or water or ammunition, the Māori inside the pa decide to make a run for it, and they escape um, through the back of the pa and a pursued by British troops and, and colonial allies as well, and, and again essentially hunted down, and huge numbers die in that pursuit. Over half of the people inside the PAR are killed, so maybe 150, 160 people killed. And there are documented cases of female prisoners being bayoneted to death in cold blood. Thomas Russell and his fellow ministers would have been fully aware of the horror of the conflict. Journalists were embedded with the British forces and filed reports like this one about Odako. Women. Many women slaughtered and many children slain are amongst the trophies of Arako. And civilization, in pursuit, or as it returned from the chase, amused itself by shooting the wounded barbarians as they lay upon the ground where they had fallen. But if Thomas and his pro-war faction felt sympathy, they certainly didn't show it. In fact, if anything, he and Frederick Whitaker pushed to make the war more horrific by passing legislation like the Suppression of Rebellion Act. Probably one of the most draconian pieces of legislation ever passed in this country. It allowed um, military tribunals to execute people without trial if they were suspected of even um, aiding or abetting people accused of committing rebellion. Contemporary critics argue that Russell and Whitaker are hell-bent on provoking even more Māori resistance because that will that will allow them to confiscate even more land. And so, for example, you have British troops deployed to Tauranga in 1864 as well, and there you have confiscations as well. And, of course, in Taranaki and, and later on uh, in the Bay of Plenty uh, and Hawke's Bay and elsewhere. So um, what happens in the Waikato is, is kind of rolled out across much of the central North Island through the 1860s. One MP, Henry Sewell, wrote at length in his journal with a disgusted tone about how a cabal of Auckland lawyers were driving Māori to rebellion. Paths, cultivation, burying grounds, all are to be swept into one great scheme of confiscation. First, to drive the natives to desperation, and then to confiscate their lands is the obvious chain in this Auckland policy. All up, more than 12,000 square kilometres of land was confiscated as a result of the Waikato Wars. And while Thomas and his mates are creaming it, even after the war ends, Māori continue to die. The survivors all retreat south of the Punyu River, and that becomes a kind of new frontier between Māori and Pākehā. And so the population of the district that becomes known as the King Country um, more than doubles overnight, but with far fewer resources to rely on and... You have reports of people dying of starvation in the first few years after the war, and um, as you get with any kind of crowded, unsanitary um, sort of housing conditions, you, you have outbreaks of disease and sickness and so on. So I think it takes a very heavy toll in those first few years, especially after the war. But while Māori were clearly the worst affected by the war, they weren't the only ones to lose out. The war's enormously costly for Britain and for the colonial government. In fact, it kicked off a financial recession, and when the military settlers came to occupy the fertile land, which was the whole objective of the conflict, they don't see much benefit either. Most of them are given 50-acre plots of land and expected to farm these, but they have no capital. Most of them have no farming experience. They have no tools. They're in the middle of an active war zone. Um, And so most of them don't even get onto their lands. It's it's just too dangerous, and what would they do there anyway? So um, after three years' service as military settler, they're entitled to receive Crown grants for their lands, and that means that they can sell them. And many of the 50-acre sections are sold for sort of 5, 10, 20 pounds or something, or in some cases it's said for a couple of bottles of whiskey. And who's there ready to buy up that land on the cheap? 
You guessed it, Thomas Russell and his rich mate suited so much to fuel the conflict in the first place. One of the things that observers note through the 1860s and 70s is just how deserted the confiscated lands look because nothing's happening there. The, the military settlers have gone. It's, it's, it's owned largely by these, these speculators from Auckland. Um, and that is, that, is, that is waiting for the for a recovery in land values after the recession. And crucially, they're also waiting for um, a railway to come through because that will dramatically increase the price of the lands. So by about 1880, a, a section of land that might have cost them about £20 to purchase in the 1860s is worth about £600. And so I calculated in my book that that's a a return on their initial investment of something like 107% per annum. So spectacular profits to be made. Imagine that, sitting on unproductive land, making profit off the capital gain while keeping it out of the reach of people who could actually do something useful with it. Bet we don't see that again in New Zealand. Anyway, sticking in the past, a lot of these investments Thomas made were, well, legally dubious. Thomas used his position in financial clout together with his position on the boards of important companies like the BNZ to enrich himself personally. In fact, he had so much power that the Minister of Lands once said of him, the vulgar idea is said to exist that Mr Thomas Russell is not the representative of the colonial government, but the colonial government is the representative of Mr Thomas Russell. One particularly dodgy deal involved the purchase of the Piaco Swamp, which was another joint operation between him and Frederick Whitaker. So that's an area of about 90,000 acres of confiscated lands in the Waikato district that they acquire in 1873 for, I think, two shillings and sixpence, which is substantially under the going rate at the time. And there's a subsequent government inquiry into this because it seems that the basic provisions for selling confiscated lands are not complied with. For example, the sale is not advertised, so there's no competition. It seems to be a sweetheart deal done for two of the most prominent people in the colony. Ironically, that's, that swamp almost drags both of them underwater because when the recession happens, they can't afford to develop it at all. Yes, I think so. 1878, the city of Glasgow Bank collapsed, and that's the sort of Lehman Brothers of its day, and that causes significant recession around the world and at the start of what's called the Long Depression in New Zealand as well. And so through the 1880s, both Whitaker and Russell incur substantial financial losses. And this is a period when they start to get into these clever financial movers through using the BNZ and other commercial vehicles that they have interests in or influence over to, to try and protect what remains of their resources. And that does quite a lot of damage to the bank. Absolutely. And certainly um, financially for the bank, it's quite ruinous, as well as, you know, harming the bank's reputation. Whitaker was forced to sell off nearly everything he had as a result of the financial crisis. He died in virtual poverty in 1891. As for Thomas Russell, he came very close to being prosecuted for fraud, but eventually recovered his financial position and died in 1904 as a very rich man. His estate was valued at the equivalent of roughly $42 million in today's money, which is almost enough to buy a decent house in Auckland today. Special thanks to Vincent O'Malley. His book is The Great War for New Zealand, Waikato, 1800-2000. to And just a reminder that if you like this podcast, please take the time to rate it and share it with your mates. Also check out RNZ's other podcasts. You can find them on the series and podcast page on our website, rnz.co.nz. Next week, the story of New Zealand's most famous grave robber. There are many accounts of him observing birds um, and then... He simply states, and I shot them. And certainly that's that's painful to read. Black Sheep was written and presented by me, William Ray, edited by Mark Chesterman. The executive producers, Tim Watkin. Our voice actors were Duncan Smith and Megan Whelan. 